Hi there, I'm your host John Iverson, happily with power restored and trees still upright after the storm in the Gatna Hills last weekend. I'm joined this week by my National Post columnist colleagues, Sabrina Madeau and Adam Zivo, who is enduring a far more deadly storm in Ukraine's second city of Kharkiv. Uh, at the moment, Adam, thanks for all you're doing to, to bring this story to life for Canadians. Um, and I gather you're in the train station right now uh, having to flee Kharkiv because uh, of what sounds like heavy shelling today. Yeah, things have been getting increasingly hairy over the past few days. And so for the past 24 hours, the shelling has been nonstop. Last night, I had to sleep in the bathtub because, let's say, from like 2 to 4 a.m., it was just explosion after explosion, air raid sirens all the time. Uh, I'm a fairly, like, I'm a, I don't get afraid often, but I, I was afraid. Um, and then earlier today, I was having dinner with a friend, and then the lights flickered off, and then we learned that uh, the Russians started shelling downtown Kharkiv again, which hasn't happened for weeks. And that killed about seven people, injured many more. And I figured at this point, uh, since downtown is no longer safe, it's probably time for me to go. So now I'm at the train station going back to Kyiv. Now, I think most of our impression is that uh, Kharkiv had been uh, retaken by the Ukrainians and that they, uh, they were on the offensive and that essentially it was all over for Kharkiv. But, but from what you're saying, it sounds like there's a counteroffensive. Yeah, see, that's what I thought too, and that's why I came here. And the thing is that downtown Kharkiv has been mostly safe for several weeks. And the shelling was limited to the northern villages that had been liberated, as well as the northern suburbs and northern residential areas such as Saltovka. And for the past week or so, those areas have been dangerous and shelled, but now uh, things are getting worse. And it's interesting, I actually think that that connects to an experience I had back on Saturday, where I was accompanying a humanitarian aid group which was delivering medicine to a northern village and we were targeted with shelling. Uh, it exploded right beside us and we realized at that point that the artillery was closer than we expected. And then I heard from a contact that apparently the Russians are bringing some heavy machinery to the front line. So it seems as if they're trying to push back. No, I mean, I think I'm pretty surprised that you were able to get a train in and now a train out again, and that you were able to find an apartment there. Uh, just tell us a little bit about what life is like. I mean, you mentioned in a piece you wrote for the Post on Saturday that it's a bit like a ghost town, a ghost town, but you get sort of mental whiplash because there are just parts that are returning to normal, I guess. I mean, they're trying to live as normally as they can given the circumstances, because you can't live in fear of war forever. So train stations and the train system in general is running fairly normally, and it's shocking how easy it is to book an Airbnb in times of war. For example, I'm going to Odessa next week, and I literally just booked an Airbnb, and it's fine. Um, now, when I first arrived, pretty much everything was closed. I couldn't find anything to eat at all. There was one shawarma place that I could find after one hour of walking. But in the past week, cafes and most, like many of them have reopened. So if you want to have a bite to eat, if you want to grab a burger, you can. Uh, obviously, many places are missing ingredients, like they won't have a certain drink or like you go to a restaurant and maybe two out of 10 items are available. But people are trying their best. There's some semblance of normalcy, which is increasing over time. But who knows how that's going to change now that the shelling has returned. I mean, it's, is there panic or is there obvious fear among the people today? I mean, it's hard to say, right, because I'm not able to interact with everyone. But I do know, for example, that the cleaning lady from my Airbnb didn't want to come to my apartment to pick up the keys when I left because she was too scared to come to the area. Uh, and I know that, you know, some of my military contacts are getting a little bit anxious and they're saying that it's getting hairy here. At the same time, Ukrainians are used to war after two, three months, and they're very risk tolerant people. So they don't get stressed out very easily. Uh, horrible things can happen in their vicinity and they'll say, yeah, it's fine. You know, what can you do about it? Sabrina, we're watching this from afar, and but it does seem to me that the, there are some early signs that Putin's misadventure may be coming to a denouement. Um, we are seeing the Russians concentrating their firepower in Donbass, so that presumably they can, can claim some sort of victory in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk provinces. They're offering to provide a humanitarian corridor for Ukrainian grain if sanctions are lifted. 
And now we're starting to see some European countries, Italy, Hungary, France, pushing the, the EU to call for a ceasefire. Do you think all this adds up to, to Ukraine eventually being pressured to make a bad deal and essentially trade uh, land for peace? It seems like there might be some appetite in the West to pressure Ukraine to make that sort of deal. But from what I've seen anyways, it doesn't seem that Ukraine itself, its political leaders are interested in making that sort of deal, and which is entirely understandable. So the fear, though, is that this could turn into one of those forever wars that stretches on years, if not a decade or more. Um, but ultimately, it's up to Ukrainian leaders and people to make that very tough call for what's best for them. What do you think, Adam? Is there any appetite at all for for some kind of land land for peace? Trade-off? No, they will never they will never accept that. And it's not about the leaders; it's about the people. You have to realize that this is not lines on a map for them. This is their families. There are people who have their parents and grandparents in these occupied areas, and they're aware of the fact that their culture is being eradicated there. They're aware of the fact that their relatives are being raped and killed. And for them, it's to, to, to have a peace, in their opinion, is to consign their families and their fellow citizens to life under a brutal occupation. And on top of that, they know that if you give Putin an inch, he'll take a mile eventually. Um, you know, you can draw a line in the sand now, and then who knows, in five, six years, when Putin's regathered his strength and planned things a little bit better, he can easily come and take more land. So they, they will not concede a single inch because they know it's going to cost them. I think Adam raises two good, great points there. That one, we've seen what Russian troops do when they capture a Ukrainian city and the horrors they've inflicted on people and innocent civilians. Um, the images, the videos have been you know, just shocking. So to concede territory and your families, your friends to that type of regime, I, I can't imagine having to even consider making that type of choice. Uh, and second, yeah, Putin won't be satiated permanently. Uh, we've seen this before with Crimea. It's never enough. He He's an expansionist. He wants the Russian empire back. Um, and if if he were to stop for a couple of years, there's nothing to say he won't be back in five, ten years. And we're back to square one. Yeah, you know, I fully agree with all of that. OK, let's move on to something that, that's important, but far less interesting, namely the election campaign in Ontario, which will be put out of its misery next week. Uh, Doug Ford went into the campaign uh, 10 points ahead. He's still 10 points ahead. Uh, Liberal rivals Stephen Del Duca and uh, New Democrat Andrea Horvath have not uh, grabbed the public imagination. Ford, maybe perhaps because he is the boy in the bubble, I was going to say despite the fact that he's not talked to the media, but perhaps because of it, um, just seems to be coasting to victory. And now nobody seems to be wildly excited about that. Uh, But at the same time, he had a reasonable pandemic. I mean, I think when you look at the number of deaths per 100,000 residents, it is almost half of what Quebec was. So nobody seems to be screaming at him to get out because uh, because of... how things went during the pandemic. But it not, has not been an exciting campaign, um, Sabrina. I think you wrote a column today which, which kind of grasped hold of something that was mildly interesting, um, but it really had nothing to do with the campaign in itself. Can you, can you tell us about the keg? Oh, yes, the keg, which has somehow become the biggest political issue of the Ontario campaign this week. Um, there was a report by Global News where they discovered that Stephen Del Duca's former riding association, back when he was the Minister of Transportation under Kathleen Wynne's government, had expensed, I think it was around $50,000 over six years of what they called fancy high-end dinners. Uh, One of those restaurants that he had expensed meals at was the keg. And this led to an online uproar over whether the keg was, is in fact, a ritzy high-end restaurant. and there was quite the political discourse. So now our biggest debate issue is, is the keg fancy or a boring chain? Some people claimed Eastside Mario's is better than the keg. There was some disagreement about that as well. But what I wrote about was the political culture we have in Canada, where we've got into this habit of witch hunting over what are really minor and often acceptable expenses for political leaders, like A a, a provincial leader is expected to wine and dine supporters and donors, and a few meals at a keg 
a year isn't something that we should be spending a lot of time and energy on. And this dates back to the infamous $16 orange juice scandal from 2012, where Canadian politicians realized how effective it could be to uh, put these sorts of things into the public consciousness and uh, spin a narrative that they were trying to use their offices for their own gain and wasting taxpayer money. Uh, but too often it's just over these minor things that are distracting and um, actually harmful to the political discourse. But it, I mean, it does speak volumes of the fact that there's very little of substance to talk about. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the opposition parties, uh, whether it's the former official opposition, the NDP or liberals, have just not been able to make anything stick. And while there are very big issues, whether it's what happened during the pandemic, whether it's affordability, the housing crisis, inflation, gas prices, all these major issues right now, but they don't seem to be able to connect with voters on them. Adam, you I know you've got more important things on your mind, but you did remark to me that you uh, were kind of surprised at um, the way things had gone with unions backing the Conservatives, or the Progressive Conservatives, rather than their traditional home with the NDP. Well, it's interesting. I'm both surprised and not surprised. I'd written an article last year about how Canadian Conservatives are beginning to go to move in and uh, take the NDP's turf when it comes to working class voters because the NDP uh, as a whole has catered too much to white collar college grads. You know, kind of like doing the whole woke culture thing instead of looking at bread and butter issues for working class folk. And that's something that you see at the federal level and makes a lot of sense considering that the federal NDP is a little bit frivolous. I mean, you think of Singh's TikTok, you know, campaign and the whole like standing in the shower uh, to make a meme thing. You know, obviously that's not going to resonate with a working mother in Northern Ontario. Uh, but the thing with Horvath is that she's a blue collar woman. She's very salt of the earth and relatable. And I think the fact that Ford has been able to steal her working class thunder is a test testifies to her weakness as a leader that she isn't able to bring her working class credentials to, uh, to the forefront and that she's being undermined by her candidates who might be a little bit more frivolous. Yeah, I mean, she's, she's, she's very good on, uh, on uh, some of these issues, but she's not a convincing uh, premier, I don't think. I don't think people think that she, she was uh, holistic enough to, 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 to generate wealth in the province. I interviewed her last week, the day before she declared she had COVID. Fortunately, she did not pass COVID on to me. So. Sorry, you, Sabrina, you were going to say something. I was going to add, it, with the labour demographic, it, the, historically we speak about unions, but there's a really new important labour demographic, which is gig workers and contract workers, especially for younger demos, which have typically been the NDP's bread and butter. And Andrea's failure to capitalise on that and motivate those voters to get out and offer them real solutions I think has been another major failure. We've seen Democrats in the states mobilize the gig worker um, and contract worker segment, and it's been quite powerful. Uh, but the NDP doesn't seem to have the ability to do that here or the appetite. Yeah, and the, and the only real movement we've seen in public support is that it looks like the Liberals will come in second and the NDP third, which really would be the end of Horvath's uh, career as leader, her fourth election. She's added seats each previous time, but it doesn't look like she will, will do this time. Finally, Wednesday saw the final debate between the Federal Conservative leadership candidates. This was one was in French. Uh, I hope neither of you watched it. I watched it so that you didn't have to. Um, it was the typical three-way grapple between Pierre Poilievre on one side and the tag team of Jean Charest and Patrick Brown on the other. Um, Poilievre referred to them as the little coalition. Uh, the other candidates were hampered by their lack of French but even Leslie and Lewis took a, a pot shot at, uh, at Poilievre at one point. And the visual of the night for me was the, uh, uh, a picture with, uh, I think it was uh, Charest yucking it up with Lewis and Roman Barber and Brown talking to Scott Aitchison while at the extreme edge of the picture Poilievre was standing safe but lonely. Um, it, it raises a question for me, where does Poilievre get second ballot support or... Maybe he doesn't need it because maybe he'll win it in the first ballot. Sabrina, what do you think? I would say he probably still does need second ballot support. Uh, we haven't seen a Conservative leader win in the first ballot in some time. Uh, I think the natural answer would be through Leslin's and Roman's supporters. However, they are also spending a lot of time attacking, attacking him. So the question is, will they 
attack him to such an extent that their supporters won't feel comfortable then supporting Pierre. Um, that's a fine line. But I do think his messaging has also been catering to um, their demographic as well. Adam, you've, you've written about uh, Scott Atchison. How did you find him? I, I mean, you know, I think that on the whole, he's a, he's the kind of conservative that I would like to see in power, but I think that he has no chance of winning, right? He's moderate, he's nuanced, he is respectful, he's, in a sense, nonpartisan. He's basically a boring policy wonk who's not, like, who's willing to call a spade a spade, for example, calling out supply management as being anti-conservative. But that doesn't win votes. It doesn't turn, it doesn't inspire people's hearts. And so um, he's my favorite prime minister who will never be. And do you think that Poiliev is, is in danger of alienating uh, maybe the kind of conservatives who, who quite like Aitchison, who just want to see a, an invigorated mainstream party? Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, like, you know, I'm in the center right, very much like close to the center, I would like to believe. And I know, for example, many of the housing advocates who I'm in contact with, I'm part of like housing Twitter, you know, they're people who are traditionally on the center left who are open to voting for center right parties, uh, who have been trending center right. And now all of that progress with them seems to have evaporated because they see cryptocurrency politics and attacks on the World Economic Forum as like this sort of big, uh, like uh, Illuminati. Yeah. So I, I think that Polyev might be setting back uh, the centrist embrace of conservatism. Yeah. Fully agree. Now, we're going to let you get away, Adam, because I know that uh, your train is leaving soon. Uh, we wish you Godspeed yeah. and stay safe. And, uh, Sabrina, thank you very Thanks. much as well. Thank you.